Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 20th of November 2020 of the Right Honourable John Douglas Anthony, ACCH, a former Deputy Prime Minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Richmond from 1957 to 1984. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Thanks, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former Deputy Prime Minister Doug Anthony. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr President. I move that the Senate expresses its sadness at the death on 20 December 2020 of the Right Honourable John Douglas Doug Anthony, ACCH, former Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for the Interior, Minister for Primary Industry and Minister for Trade and Resources, and former Member for Richmond. Places on record its admiration and appreciation for his service to the Parliament and the nation and tenders its deep, deep sympathy to his family in their bereavement. The Right Honourable John Douglas Doug Anthony was an Australian icon who humbly served our nation in a life of public service. Doug Anthony was born in Merwimbulla, New South Wales, on 31 December 1929. Tales abound of Doug's early exposure to federal politics and the federal parliament as a young lad foretelling his own path of a prominent political career. His father, Hubert Lawrence Anthony, had been elected to the parliament in 1937. From the age of seven, Doug would join his father in Canberra, often staying in the Currajong Hotel, where he got to know many members of parliament and ministers of the era on a personal level. Rumour even has it that much of young Doug's time spent at the old parliament house saw him utilise the lower floor of the building for roller skating. Doug was educated at King's School in Sydney and Gatton College in Queensland before going on to become a dairy farmer until 1957, when his father, a then minister in the Menzies government, passed away. At the age of 27, Doug left the farming to contest and win his late father's seat of Richmond. The electorate of Richmond would reward the hard work and dedication shown by Doug Anthony by returning him as their local MP for a further 11 elections. Doug's parliamentary career stretched more than 26 years, 16 of them spent as a Minister of the Crown. He held responsibility for a variety of portfolios, serving as Minister for the Interior, Primary Industry, Trade and Industry overseas trade, minerals and energy, national resources and trade and resources. When the then Prime Minister, Sir Robert Menzies, first promoted Doug Anthony in 1964 to become Minister for the Interior, the youngest member at the time to be made a minister, he said, that'll keep you out of mischief. Doug Anthony assumed much responsibility for the advancement and establishment of this our nation's capital the seat of government here in Canberra. As Minister for the Interior, he played a role in the development of the Anzac Parade and the construction of the National Library and National Carillon, as well as the opening of Lake Burley Griffin as we know it today. Later in life, Doug reflected on how happy and proud he was of his connection to the city of Canberra, to which he believed no other capital in the world would compare. Today, those of us who serve in this place and the many who live in Canberra enjoy the fruits of his leadership and those who worked alongside of him. On the 2nd of February 1971, almost 50 years ago to this day, Doug Anthony, at the age of 41, became the youngest leader of the then country party. As leader, Doug took steps to modernise the party, recognising that the party had to broaden its base. This included a change of name to the National Party in 1982. In, the, in a testament to Doug's leadership style, throughout his tenure, the National Party was able to enjoy strong unity and, of course, build its reputation across many parts of Australia. Doug Anthony served the country as Deputy Prime Minister for nearly 10 years, marking the longest such tenure of anyone in the role. He was Deputy to Prime Ministers John Gorton, Billy McMahon and Malcolm Fraser, serving under Malcolm Fraser for the full period of the coalition government from 1975 to 1983. 
This tenure is a demonstration of Doug Anthony's commitment as a great coalitionist, setting the standards of engagement between the great National Party of Australia and the great Liberal Party of Australia that have served very many coalition governments thereafter. As Minister for Primary Industry, Doug regarded these years as some of his hardest, and yet through that period he was a fierce advocate for Australian farmers and regional Australia, particularly in tough meetings, for example, over European farming policies. Among his achievements in the role were upgrades to export abattoirs to maintain the beef trade, introduction of the wool reserve price scheme and the reconstruction of the dairy industry. Doug also served as Australia's 33rd minister responsible for the trade portfolio. I'm proud to have shared a passion for trade with Doug, having until recently served in the role myself as Australia's 53rd trade minister. As we reflect on Doug Anthony's achievements in the trade portfolio, it's important to note the role he played in expanding particularly our strong trading relationship with Japan. These were leading pioneers of the era in establishing and deepening those relations with nations like Japan, especially in the export of major commodities such as iron ore and coal. Doug Anthony also showed enormous leadership and insight in focusing on creating opportunities across the ASEAN countries and in the Middle East. He was the first senior Australian minister to be visited to visit the Middle East where several important trade-related agreements followed with countries across the region. Perhaps most notably, Doug Anthony made history as the minister responsible for negotiating the Australia-New Zealand Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement. In 2003, Australia and New Zealand commemorated the 20th anniversary of the signing of the 1983 agreement. In a joint publication marking the occasion, former Prime Minister John Howard described the success of the CER, saying, it is a powerful testimony to the vision of both governments and of their negotiators that the CER remains one of the widest ranging and most successful free trade agreements in the world even today. That enduring success from which every Australian and New Zealander now benefits reminds us in turn how important it is to continue pursuing the goal of further liberalisation of world trade. Eighteen years on from former Prime Minister Howard's remarks about the CER and the bonds that it has established between Australia and New Zealand, it remains our most important trade agreement and the most significant pillar in terms of an example of true openness and cooperation. The beginnings of the CER can be traced to an informal discussion with New Zealand ministers in 1979, where Doug Anthony brought to the attention of the room the limited prospects for trade growth for either nation under their existing then multilateral trade negotiations or strategies. Doug will go on to speak of the success achieved by other nations which cooperated economically to take advantage of the trading potential within their region. He suggested that it was time for Australia and New Zealand to take advantage of the new global circumstances and in doing so to form a closer union of economic cooperation. The positive reception by New Zealand ministers of Doug Anthony's proposal at this meeting marked the beginnings of the formal process of the Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement. And Though the agreement was finally signed off just a few weeks into the life of the Hawke government, Doug Anthony was acknowledged as the engineer of the agreement and indeed was conferred an honorary doctorate from New Zealand's University of Canterbury. Since then, the Australia-New Zealand Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement has become a model for trade agreements across the globe, a fact I can attest in my own undertakings of similar negotiations. Doug Anthony was Australian through and through. Perhaps few stories better illustrate this than when then Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser would take his annual summer holidays, leaving Doug in charge of the nation. Doug Anthony's choice of office was a caravan by his cottage at New Brighton on the New South Wales north coast, which caught the attention of the media. In his own words, Doug said, I'll probably be remembered for the caravan more than anything else in my political career. When the nation heard I was running the show from my caravan, it sent a message that it was Christmas. Time to relax, 
Everything was on hold, but also everything was being looked after. Doug retired from the federal parliament in January of 1984. He left on his own terms as father of the house with a record of accomplishments that few could match and returned to his dairy farm. But he remained active in public life, including campaigning for an Australian Republic at the 1999 constitutional referendum. Echoing the words of our current Prime Minister, the Right Honourable John Douglas Anthony was a quiet giant of Australian political life, a man who left an indelible and positive mark on our nation, our coalition of Liberal and National Parties, and particularly upon his beloved National Party. Doug Anthony led a long and meritorious life of public service, and we express our deepest thanks and profound sympathy to his wife Margot, his three children, Dougal, Jane and Larry, and his nine grandchildren. I thank the Senator. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Minister for his reflection on the life of the former Deputy Prime Minister, John Douglas, Doug Anthony. I rise to contribute to this condolence motion, and I do so both in honour of Mr Anthony's service and as a proud resident of New South Wales, his home state. It is clear from the tributes that flowed following his death that Mr Anthony was held in high regard as a thoroughly decent man who exemplifies what it means to serve your community and your country. Mr Anthony demonstrated a deep commitment to public service. He was elected to the federal seat of Richmond in 1957 in a by-election after his father, who had held the seat, died suddenly. In his first speech to the parliament, Doug Anthony warned that while members of parliament should express the views upon which they were elected to office, he noted that a member should, quote, set his target at national development and security rather than personal achievement. He spent a career pursuing the former, and he certainly achieved the latter. Mr. Anthony's parliamentary career spanned nearly three decades, more than half of which involved service as a minister in government. The commitment he brought to the broader goals of the office was evident in the way he discussed his career, humbly remarking in his later years, I'm very fortunate to be where I am. I think I was making a useful contribution, and that's the satisfaction I get out of the job. Mr. Anthony appeared to have an admirable humility about his work and his role. He often performed his role as acting prime minister during the summer, as Minister Birmingham noted, in a caravan by his cottage in New Brighton on the New South Wales north coast, wearing little more than shorts and thongs. Now, during the lockdown year, many members of parliament were able to have their own experience of working from the New South Wales coast or wherever their lounge rooms happened to be. And if Zoom's any indicator, most did wear more than shorts and thongs. But it is appropriate that the linchpin of Australia's government would temporarily find itself in the bush by the sea on those summers. Mr Anthony was a passionate advocate for regional Australia. He worked with the Country Party to represent the diversity of people living in regional Australia and bring their voice to Canberra. He made it clear that his responsibility was to the agriculture producers of this country. Doug Anthony was Minister for Primary Industry during an incredibly difficult period for Australian farmers, but he showed a tenacity in his work and his negotiating style that would come to define his career. He helped establish the Australian Wool Commission, which administered reserve price schemes and provided funds for marketing and research. When the price of grain crashed in 1969, he introduced wheat quotas to limit overproduction and encouraged the Australian Wheat Board to open flour mills overseas. It was during this period that Mr Anthony, like me and many other members of this place, became an advocate for an Australian Republic. During particularly tense negotiations with the British Agriculture Minister Geoffrey Rippon over European farm policies, Mr Anthony said, It was the contempt I couldn't put up with. It's always been the attitude of the colonial powers. After the loyalty we'd shown, the wars we'd fought, I thought it was a pretty shabby way to treat us. And that led him to become a campaigner, alongside my uncle Tom Keneally, for the 1999 Republican campaign. He believed in giving Australians the recognition and the respect they deserved, particularly rural Australians. As his family noted upon his passing, 
He was very much a man of the Tweed region, and it is fitting he should depart this life from within the community he loves so much. Now, despite being at home in the country, Mr. Anthony was one of the architects of the modern and vibrant Canberra we know today. As Minister for the Interior, he helped finish the transition of government department head offices from Melbourne to Canberra, thank goodness, overseeing the construction across the city and injecting character into the national capital. It was Mr. Anthony who was responsible for the construction of the National Library and the opening of Lake Burley Griffin. Mr. Anthony and his wife Margot were well known in Canberra for providing emotional support to members of the local community who have disabilities. As devoted as he was to his community, Doug Anthony was evidently a dedicated husband, father, and family man. He married Margot in 1957. They had three children, Dougal, Jane, and Larry, and eventually, and I'm sure he was very delighted, with nine grandchildren. I was struck by the description of, Mr. of, of Margot and, Anth and Doug's marriage as a, quote, romance that never died. He was loved fiercely in return by his family, who were never lost in the shadows of the enormity of his public service. Now, many in the community will also remember Mr. Anthony for being the only Australian member of parliament, at least that I'm aware of, to have a band named after him. When Paul McDermott, Tim Ferguson, and Richard Feidler decided to form a musical comedy band called the Doug Anthony All-Stars, Mr. Anthony took it in the good humor in which it was met. My friend Tim Fer Ferguson told me, he was always a true gentleman who tolerated our antics with great patience and hopefully forgiveness. Now, while I didn't know Doug Anthony personally, when I read that his most famous saying was, if you see a head, kick it, I thought the two of us might have gotten along. My condolences are with Margot, with his children, his grandchildren, and his community on the New South Wales North Coast. May we look to his legacy of that as an honourable man and a true Australian statesman. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I rise as Leader of the Nationals in the Senate to contribute um, to the condolence debate contributions on the passing of the Right Honourable Doug Anthony and want to thank Senator Keneally and Senator Birmingham uh, for their heartfelt words and um, I think some colourful turn of phrase that really does, did capture um, Doug, um, his love of country and his love of his nation and his uh, love of his family. Our thoughts and condolences go to Margot, Dougal, Jane, Larry and their families. Uh, it's obviously a sad occasion for uh, the National Party family, as it is for many people across Australia. He was a giant of our party. He just wasn't the Deputy Prime Minister or the member for Richmond, but he very much uh, was the leader of the country party and then National Party. Part of an iconic era, really, for our party, post uh, John McEwen, um, the Fab Four, uh, Doug Anthony, Peter Nixon, Ian Sinclair and uh, Ralph Hunt uh, were a force to be reckoned with uh, on behalf of regional Australia but also uh, within the coalition. It's fitting to repeat the words of Doug himself when he spoke of the passing of another giant of the then country party, John McEwen, in November 1980. McEwen, Doug Anthony, said, was a strong man. He was at times a hard, tough, demanding man. He was a man of integrity, a man of honour, he was a powerful negotiator and a persuasive advocate. Mr President, I believe Doug Anthony may well have been describing himself as he was all that. In recent weeks, Doug has been described in many ways, a true statesman, a man of honour and integrity, a humble man, ever positive and ever connected to the Tweed region around uh, Merwillumbar, Merwillumbar in the Northern Rivers. The man from Merwillumbar did not set out to become a household name and it very nearly didn't happen. But Doug Anthony is a household name, and John McEwen played a significant role. He picked him out early uh, in this group of new young men that arrived in Parliament House as a restless young backbencher and provided him, um, promising him a ministry. And I think would have, that would have um, been a great loss to the nation had uh, 
Doug left early. When I was chatting to uh, his son, Larry Anthony, who is also the current National Party federal pe president, about uh, Doug's experience with John McEwen, uh, he recalled that there was a time Menzies considered promoting a very young Doug Anthony to the Minister of the Navy before McEwen actually intervened. He believed Doug was too young and would not be respected in the portfolio by the uh, chiefs of defence and that he needed time to grow into the role to become everything that McEwen knew this young man would be as a leader. And so McEwen pushed for a portfolio he thought he could thrive in as for Minister of the Interior, and that's what happened. So, because at that time it goes that Doug was actually looking for opportunities beyond politics because he'd been catapulted, if you like, so early uh, into parliament following the death of his father. So we can be very, very thankful for Blackjack's mentorship. Doug Anthony was born on New Year's Eve in 1929 and after his schooling at the local secondary college, the King's School in Parramatta and Gatton College in Queensland, he became a dairy farmer. It was his deep and abiding passion. It's all he wanted to do um, was be on the farm and, and obviously to produce milk at that time. That changed in 1957 when his own father, Larry Anthony Senior, a min minister in the Menzies government, died and Doug was elected to the federal seat of Richmond uh, at the by-election at just 27. His parliamentary career spanned more than 26 years, 16 of which involved service as a government minister. Doug held a variety of portfolios, serving as Minister for the Interior, Primary Industry, Trade and Industry, Overseas Trade, Minerals and Energies, National Resources and Trade and Resources, all very um, hearty uh, National Party, Country Party portfolios there. He was made Deputy Leader of the Country Party in 1966 and at aged 41 became our party's youngest leader following the retirement of John McEwen in 1971, a record that is yet to be broken. He was Deputy Prime Minister to three Liberal Prime Ministers, John Gorton, Billy McMahon and Malcolm Fraser. And during his time as Prime Minister for Primary Industries then Trade, he drove significant reform, opening up new trade opportunities for agriculture and mining. Just as our current government leadership sets out to expand trade markets amid growing Chinese tensions. It was under Doug Anthony's trade ministership and that of his predecessor, John McEwen, that laid the foundations to help make this happen. Along with fellow national Ian Sinclair, Doug Anthony, as Minister for the Interior, was one of the two last survivors of Sir Robert Menzies' last ministry. Ian Sinclair, uh, Minister for Social Services in the 10th Menzies Ministry, who replaced Doug Anthony as National Party leader, upon his retirement, said of his predecessors, and I quote, predecessor, as members of the National Party, we are proud of his leadership of the party. Peter Nixon, Ralph Hunt and all those of us who are members of the party remember him kindly for the way in which he led and kept the party together. There is no doubt that as we look back on him, those times were different. But looking at modern Australia, so much of it began in the days when Doug Anthony was Deputy Prime Minister. And so much of all of those things that we cherish today Doug had a hand in. Australia has a vibrant trade-oriented farm and mining industries today, delivering huge improvements to living standards for all Australians because Doug Anthony saw the opportunities in the 1970s and the 1980s. In The Spectator, Terry Barnes wrote, it is a cliche to say we'll never see his like again, but it certainly is so. Backed by his loyal deputy, Sinclair, Doug Anthony oversaw the transformation of the country party to the national party. He said the name change reflected Australia's changing political scene. Announcing it, he acknowledged the importance of farming to rural Australia, saying farmers' prosperity was the basis of prosperity of many rural towns and of industries and employment outside the city. But he stressed the party works for all people outside major capital cities. Former Federal Director of the Liberal Party, Brian Lochnane, described Doug Anthony as a committed coalitionist. And that was on evidence at his uh, state memorial last week in the Tweed, uh, where we saw icons of the National Party Country Party gather, uh, former state premiers, ministers, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister Warren Truss, alongside our current Prime Minister. Um, and former Prime Minister John Howard, who spoke so eloquently of the time he served with Doug uh, in Parliament. 
It was the likes of Doug Anthony and his colleagues Peter Nixon and Ian Sinclair who demonstrated to both parties what would be achieved through the partnership of two very proud uh, and independent political movements. It has been noted amongst my national colleagues that while Doug Anthony was a committed coalitionist in front of the opposition, he was fiercely committed to the nationals' cause in joint party room and cabinets. Former Prime Minister John Howard was a minister with Doug under Malcolm Fraser. And he said Doug Anthony's contributions in cabinet discussions were always direct, understandable, uninformed and unshakable. He um, recalls a particular uh, situation, and he assured me that um, it had been more than 30 years, so he could talk about it. Uh, but uh, went at the memorial service last week, where um, whilst Fraser had been overseas, he'd left uh, Doug in charge. Doug had made a decision around um, parliamentary salaries and remuneration, which then the opposition seized on. Uh, and it was overturned when, by the PM when he, he got back. And uh, it was a very furious and forthright Doug that um, made it very clear to the then PM that if he was left in charge, uh, he expected to be able to exercise that uh, with the full authority. So no one was ever um, under any doubt about what he thought. But he was uh, very generous and likeable, and uh, there's stories. Um, one of the stories I read was very, very handsome man. Um, so you sort of he's on the TV, you know, TV campaigning, and uh, women kissing the TV uh, when he actually came on for his um, campaign messages, which you know is a great thing for um, I think his son, who was door knocking the seat of Richmond at the time, uh, to hear that he was Doug's son and um, that's what she thought of his dad. Uh, anyway, so his affable style endeared him to his colleagues and, most importantly, the farmers and other constituents he represented. Former leader of the Nationals in the Senate, Senator Ron Boswell, described Doug Anthony as a strong, popular and decisive leader who understood the power he had within a coalition to be wielded only when necessary. Senator Boswell recounted being summoned to Doug Anthony's office immediately after delivering his own first speech in this chamber. Doug told him, Ron, you got into the Senate on Flo's petticoat tails by being the gopher boy for the Queensland National Party, but that won't cut anything down here. You'll be a one-termer unless you understand Canberra and how the system works to assist rural and regional constituents. Clearly, from his long and very, very successful career on delivering, Senator Boswell paid uh, attention to his leader's uh, words. He represented the Nationals and Queensland for over 30 years. My deputy in the Senate, Senator Canavan, tells a story um, of Doug Anthony was uh, reading through his papers on a flight to New Zealand, uh, asking his advisers, why am I going over here? I'm checking this agenda. There's nothing on it. There's nothing to discuss. And by the time they landed, Doug had made an addition to the agenda and the Australian-New Zealand closer economic relationship was born. Never one to waste an opportunity, typical of a farmer and a great leader. He regarded the economic relationship as a major achievement. It became a blueprint for future trade agreements. He negotiated with China. He was the first senior Australian minister to negotiate the live sheep trade with the Middle East. Doug built a strong import and export relationship with the emerging industry powerhouse of Japan, uh, building on the strong work of his former mentor, John McEwen. He understood the need for strong rural and regional representation at the highest level of governments and was a fierce advocate for the opening of new trade opportunities. Whether it was in defence of the wool floor price, opposition to increasing the value of the dollar, or his defence, which I think was the only thing he and John Howard ever disagreed on, uh, or his defence of single desk selling, Doug Anthony stuck to his intent to deliver for rural Australia. He was also heavily involved in the development of Canberra. The Anthony family is synonymous with the country and National Party. Doug, his father, Hubert Lawrence Anthony, and current Nationals Federal President Larry Anthony all represented the Federal Division of Richmond for a combined 67 years. Doug retired from Federal Parliament in January 1984, returning to the farm, Sunny Meadows, which had expanded beyond the dairy uh, to include now a piggery, cotton and cereal operations. Uh, he held several corporate positions in retirement. 
But around this time of his retirement, that uh, trio of buskers on the streets of Canberra actually adopted his name. Upon meeting Doug via the TV show Video Hookup, Doug Anthony All-Stars member Paul McDermott said he found Doug generous, kindly and accepting. And Doug, with his trademark country smile and tongue firmly in cheek, said, that, said of this particular meeting that it was, and I quote, an auspicious occasion. It's the first time I've met these plagiarists who've made my life miserable ever since I retired. I hope to keep it out of the public limelight. What happens? I walk down the street and people say, that's a great band of yours. <laughs> Was it those iconic pictures of the acting Prime Minister running the country over the summer holidays from a caravan at New Brighton up the New South Wales coast that made him a household name? He, was, he did say, when the nation heard I was running the show from my caravan, it sent a message it was Christmas, time to relax, everything was on hold, but also that everything was being looked after. But I think it was also a demonstration to all of us um, that of his commitment to his family in what was an incredible public life. Um, Larry also told a great story that um, Prime Minister Fraser was very keen to keep in touch with his um, deputy quite regularly, but the only way to do that was um, the public phone down the road. So, armed with like a stack of 20 cent pieces, he'd send Larry to wait in the line with the locals until it actually got uh, far enough up to get Dad up from the caravan to take the Prime Minister's call until the 20 cent pieces ran out. Uh, got very, very frustrated, shall we say, for Prime Minister Fraser, who then ended up giving the caravan a fantastic upgrade so that it could have a direct line. And what I think that said was that Doug was not for moving in January, um, so, and Prime Minister paid attention and, and got the best of both worlds. So um, a, a great example for us all. In 2014, he said, I don't see the purpose in people remembering much, but I don't think he got his wish there because he's very much well remembered uh, by all of us. He was a statesman of the highest degree. Um, he was a giant of our party and he's left a lasting positive impact on modern Australia and in particular regional Australia. Our sympathies are to his family and to the wider country party. Um, decency, intelligence, humility, generosity. Uh, he and Margot retired, the love of his life, retired to the Tweed where he enjoyed listening to her play the piano. Uh, on the farm to fish, often with Peter Nixon, uh, to spend time with the family, to support the arts and the wider community. A very proud countryman and someone we are also similarly very, very proud of. Vale Doug Anthony. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, I too would like to echo the, the celebration of a great Australian leader in this chamber this afternoon. Uh, Doug Anthony was a leader that I don't think any other country in the world could have produced. Uh, he was quintessentially Australian, identifiably Australian. Uh, perhaps he, he might not be the type of leader we ever have see again uh, in Australia. I hope not. I hope we haven't lost uh, 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 his uh, down-to-earth nature, uh, his country charm uh, and, of course, uh, his larrikin spirit. Uh, Doug. Uh, Doug uh, was our longest serving uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, and uh, he led our country through great change and transition, changes and transitions that impacted the uh, then country party but now Nationals party uh, greatly uh, and he did so extremely successfully. Uh, as I said, I, he was a real larrikin, a uh, real Australian larrikin as a leader and that comes through in the stories that have been told here this afternoon in the in the, the beachside caravan, the, the uh, calls from the Prime Minister on the payphone that his kids were operating. Uh, and another story I'd like to tell as well here that uh, was, I think, uh, well, certainly I uh, learnt through uh, Senator Davey's father's history of the Nationals Party. Uh, uh, a young MP, as a young MP, Doug Anthony at Old Parliament House was getting a little bit bored. Uh, sometimes we're here for long periods of time, sometimes we're here for, at late nights. And uh, he and some other members of parliament decided to, uh, uh, to engage in some uh, late night uh, uh, kicking of a football 
uh, although it just so happened they'd be doing that kicking in King's Hall uh, in the front of Parliament House there. You can still go and visit. It's a big expanse, but I've never really thought of kicking a football in there. I thought that might be a bit disrespectful. But uh, Doug, as a real larrikin, was kicking the football around. Unfortunately, this stray football hit one of the large portrait frames uh, that uh, still appear in, in our equivalent of King's Hall here. Um, and uh, this frame smashed, uh, fell to the ground. The glass inside smashed all over the floor. Uh, Doug and his uh, partners in crime quickly swept all the glass up, hung the, the frame back up as best they could, and apparently the broken frame went years without being detected uh, until finally someone realised that glass needed to be replaced. It, I'm sure they said it was like that when we got here. So um, he was a great, great leader. Uh, as I said, Doug, Doug became leader of the Country Party in, in 1971. He, he followed in, in some huge shoes of uh, John Blackjack McEwen. Uh, and prior to that time, uh, prior to his time as leader, uh, the three previous leaders, or at least there was, I think, a transition leader, but the three previous major leaders were, were Earl Page, Arthur Fadden, and John McEwen, absolute giants of, uh, of Australian politics and indeed all. Uh, members of parliament became prime minister at some times in their careers. So Doug had a tough act to follow, a real tough act to follow. And at the same time, uh, the country party was facing enormous challenges with farming employment declining as part of the Australian economy, uh, a broader shift uh, in Australian society on a number of issues, and the trading relationship uh, pressures that uh, my colleague Senator Mackenzie was, was mentioning. And, and he, he, he tackled this issue front on, uh, and it was always only going to be the only successful way uh, was to tackle it. And at, at Doug's first press conference uh, as leader of, of the country party, he, he, he summed up quite nicely what I think became the manifesto of uh, then the Nationals Party in his term. He said, I think we service that responsibility well to look after people not just outside capital cities, not just farmers. Uh, and indeed, that does his definition last on in the logo now of the Nationals Party for regional Australia. Uh, perhaps there is a dividing line in, in our party's history pre Doug Anthony and post Doug Anthony. Pre Doug Anthony, the party probably was primarily focused on farming issues and, a, and, a, and was started as a farmer's party and retained that focus through its first 50 odd years of life. Uh, uh, but perhaps the second half of the Nationals Party history, a party that celebrated 100 years last year, the second uh, 50 years has been a broader focus uh, on people who live outside regional Australia, including, of course, farmers, who by definition do live outside capital cities, but also on a broader focus on those that face challenges living away from our major centres that are, don't have access to the same services as those in capital cities and who are desperate to see our country grow uh, and develop. He also oversaw the broadening of the base of the Nationalist Party for, to, 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 to those who work in, in mines, uh, to small business people uh, uh, and to those families in country towns. And, 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 and the way he did that was, was through making uh, good leadership decisions, especially in, in his role in different portfolios. As I mentioned, he came, when you think about when he became uh, a Deputy Prime Minister and the leader of the Country Party. It was at a time when the UK had just joined the European Commission. Uh, at the time, in the late 1960s, the UK imported 80 per cent of Australia's butter. 80 per cent of our butter went to the UK, imagine that. Uh, uh, our dairy herd after the UK joined the EC fell from 4 million to 2.4 million head in the space of just a few years. Uh, fruit exports crashed and millions of trees had to be pulled up because we lost markets for tinned fruit and vegetables. Uh, uh, and it was a major ch challenge in rural Australia. Now, the groundwork had been laid in, in agreements that John McEwen had, had signed, with, with Japan especially, but it was, left, it was really Doug who, who, who took those agreements uh, and made them, the, the, the gig, made them into the full opportunity that uh, was there for Australia. Uh, he pushed uh, the development of, of extra uh, uh, exports to the Japanese market. He also opened up and looked at new markets, signing what really was the first modern free trade agreement, not just for Australia but for the world. Uh, Bridget mentioned the story of Doug being frustrated with uh, boring uh, departmental uh, uh, 
uh, uh, written agenda items, and I, and I share some sympathy as a former minister with his frustration that uh, perhaps why am I going to this meeting? It doesn't seem to be much we're saying to each other. Um, but Doug took action. He took action and decided, well, why don't we add some things to the agenda and actually make some decisions? And um, so that the, what, what came out of those discussions was the, uh, not just the first free trade agreement for Australia of, of that nature, but really the first in the world. When you look, there's a massive difference between the agreement we signed with Japan in 1957 that kicked off our modern trade uh, environment, signed by John McEwen. It was a letter. It was an exchange of letters, just ten or so pages. Uh, whereas the New Zealand comprehensive, it was called the comprehensive uh, economic relationship, covered a vast sway of different areas and sectors, which served as a template uh, for the multiple free trade agreements we have today, and, and have been replicated by many countries in, in NAFTA and, and other, other trade agreements around the world. He also established new trading links with the Middle East, uh, pioneered the development of that. And, and Doug was the, I think, first and certainly the, the, the last resources minister before I was the resource minister, the last resource minister from the Nationals Party. Uh, uh, and, and that's something that goes uncommented a little bit, the, the role he played uh, in, in developing our nation's resources. He oversaw the development of our uranium exports for the first time, a controversial issue uh, that he championed. Uh, uh, he also negotiated very difficult, very toughly, very strongly with uh, Japanese uh, steel, buy, steel mills who are buying our iron ore and push them for higher prices. Indeed, there's a great story where he, as acting PM, just made a decision to, uh, to, to refuse to sell to put export controls on, on, on iron ore. Um, and uh, uh, the then Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser was not too happy about that, but Doug stuck to his guns and did get better prices uh, for our iron ore because of his action. He did work productively with Liberal leaders, and, and he was a coalitionist, as Senator McKenzie said, but we shouldn't forget that he, was, he stood up very strongly for his own party's interests in discussions with the Liberal Party. He, at one point, led uh, with his Cabinet colleagues uh, uh, three walkouts in three days from Cabinet over a discussion on the exchange rate. And I think uh, his, Doug's action in, 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 in moving uh, the Nationals Party to a broader base, uh, uh, but doing so consistent with the strong leadership that has always existed uh, within the Nationals Party, helped ensure that the second half century of the Nationals Party continued to be a successful uh, one. Uh, we have been rewarded uh, politically because we have fought for regional areas by supporting the development of dams, uh, the development of new mines. Uh, uh, the protection of industries like cattle exports, live cattle exports. We have opposed taxes and regulations that would inhibit job growth and production in regional areas. And we've took up the fight just like Doug did in his time. Uh, we've done so with no airs or graces, uh, um, happily living in caravans if, if, if Doug's his want, or going back to our own families and communities and just being as much as we can close to the people and defending their rights and interests, regardless of what people might say about us down here. He's a great lesson to, to our party. Uh, he was a great leader for our country. It's a great loss for Australia, but especially for his family. He's passing, and I want to pass on my deepest condolences to his, uh, his broader family, to Margot, and especially his love of his life, and, and Vale, Doug, Doug Anthony. Senator, Mc oh, Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, I would like to add some short comments in this tribute to Doug Anthony. Uh, much has already been said about Mr Anthony's career and his achievements, um, both in this chamber as well as at his state memorial service in Tweed's Heads last Thursday. I first met Mr Anthony, or Doug, uh, when I was a young teenager whose main understanding of politics was it was just something my dad and his friends talked about. At the time, I had little concept of the import of the Deputy Prime Minister or the role that Doug had played in shaping our nation, particularly in the regions. And testament to the kind of man he was, Doug did not stand on ceremony with me. He did not speak down to me or make me feel inferior. He spoke to me like he spoke to everyone, as an equal. His genuine, easygoing manner, warm, broad smile and his quick sense of humour was endearing. 
And it was only in subsequent years, as I got to know both him and his wife Margot, as well as their son Larry, that I got to understand that the kind, warm man that I knew had actually been one of our longest serving deputy prime ministers, a champion for rural industries, and a man who had done so much to shape our modern nation. Indeed, Doug was an original futurist. He, he was a man who really saw potential and saw what the future might bring. Um, he made much of recognising the future mechanisation of agriculture. Um, as the Minister for the Interior, which was his for first po portfolio, he helped shape the national capital that we all stand in today. Um, it was not long after, in pol political terms, um, when he, only six years after being elected, he took on the role as Minister for Interior. And he took it on with the same level of commitment as he did everything. And he was therefore instrumental in shaping Canberra, involved in development such as the Canberra Theatre, Anzac Parade, the Mint, choosing the site for the Carillion, and he lobbied for the Captain Cook Jet Fountain, which was ultimately switched on by his successor in the portfolio, but which he was very proud of. Um, he was also fundamental in uh, starting the work and establishing the new town centres of Woden and Belconnen, which are now part of inner city Canberra, uh, as, as the success of the national capital has seen it expand. But he was also a futurist in other areas. As mentioned by Senator Canavan, he, he identified the trade opportunities in uranium, which is now a zero emissions product. Uh, so he was on the money. He was one of the first to identify the opportunities of working from home, as has been uh, mentioned. So, you know, uh, he, he would have done very well in the, later, in the COVID lockdown as he was fully prepared for that sort of a lifestyle and that sort of working environment. But, you know, uh, you should ask why was Doug so adept at such a young age, politically speaking, at representing both his rural constituency as well as taking on ministerial responsibilities and negotiating you know, bilateral trade agreements. And to understand that, you need to understand a bit about Doug's background. The Anthony family are the only political dynasty in Australia, and there are a few, but they are the only one to have seen three consecutive generations in the same House of Representatives electorate being Doug's father, Hubert, who was also known in Canberra as Larry, Doug, and his second son, Larry. Hubert was a soldier turned farmer, turned local MP, and then finally a minister, and he taught his son much. Doug's upbringing was split between visits to Canberra and the family home at Mwoolambar on the north coast. But Doug was always encouraged to be his own man and to determine his own destiny. And Doug was not initially drawn into politics. As mentioned by Senator Birmingham, he first turned his attention to farming. He established his dairy and he set about with full gusto learning about primary production practices both here and abroad. He travelled extensively and learned a lot. Indeed, as outlined in the book mentioned by Senator Canavan, Politics in the Blood, um, it is revealed that after one international visit, Doug returned to be greeted by his ministerial father at the airport with media in train. His father told him to take the hat off, claiming he looked ridiculous, but Doug left his straw Stetson on his head as he regaled the, the surrounding newsmen about the streamlined production methods and the extensive use of modern machinery and efficient distribution facilities in the new US. And he confidently predicted that Australian farmers would have to adapt to be able to continue to compete. Settling back into Australia, Doug found continuing interest in what he learned, and he sought out to share his experiences talking at Rotary, business chambers and farming organisations. 
He spoke eloquently not only about primary production, but also the mechanisation, technological advances and innovation. His easygoing approach, clear delivery uh, and amicable nature saw him in high demand, which in turn saw him further fine-tune his public speaking skills and ability to adopt and adapt new ideas. And I believe it was that early career and experience that was fundamental to building the successful politician and leader that we remember here today. And successful he was by any measure. He was a minister in all coalition governments from March 1964 onwards. He was a cabinet minister from October 1967 and deputy prime minister and frequently acting Prime Minister from February 1971 to December 72, and then again from December 75 to March 1983. And it was during the very towards the end of that time that I first met him, when he uh, requested that my father take over the directorship of the National Party, promising Dad that they would make a great team, and he wanted to work with my dad. And shortly after my dad took the role, Doug promptly resigned. <laughs> So, as leader of um, his elevation to the leadership, Mark did mark a generational change in the party's evolution, as uh, Senator Canavan discussed. He broadened the party's platform and widened its electoral appeal, and that has helped to cement our party's ongoing relevance in Australian politics. And that is why our party has now spanned a hundred years, and we are all very proud of that. As leader of the party, indeed during the Fraser Anthony years, it was often said that the Nationals wielded more influ influence than their parliamentary de numbers deserved. But that assertion ignores the fact that the success was because the Nationals brought forward good policies and that Doug could champion those policies such that they became government policy. And that is the power of cooperative coalition. In his retirement, Doug returned to his farm, Sunny Meadows, and worked just as hard for his passion projects. Together with his wife, Margot, they donated some of their land for the development of new premises for the Tweed River Art Gallery. Known today as the Tweed Regional Gallery, it is now recognised as a leading regional art gallery in Australia. And turning full circle, in 1999, he again took a role that saw him help shape our national capital. He was appointed chairman of the old Parliament House Advisory Council. The role took him back to his childhood and reminded him of the days when he used to visit his father. In those days, old Parliament House was a relatively new Parliament House of 11 years old. So being there on that board and helping supervise refurbishments and determine the future for that grand old building was a job he absolutely loved. And he was fundamental to the building becoming what is, it is now, the Permanent Museum of Political History here in Canberra. He retired from the role in November 2008 and uh, spent the remainder of his time with his family, surrounded by loved ones uh, in the North Coast. So this was the kind man that I knew. And while many in Doug's position could easily have forgotten that awkward teen, uh, he did not. He always greeted me warmly, remembered my name, which for some old politicians that I knew was quite remarkable, but greeted me warmly, and he always took an interest in what I was up to through all stages of my life, no matter where our paths crossed or when. I held Doug and his family in enormous regard, and I still do. And my thoughts and prayers are with Margot, Dougal, Larry and Jane. Doug was a great MP, a great minister, a great party leader, but most importantly, he was a genuine person and a great man. Vale. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. So much has already been said of the late, great Doug Anthony, and the Anthony family has given so much to Australia. 
Through politics, they have entrenched themselves into the fabric of the nation and particularly rural Australia. My home state of Queensland particularly owes Doug a great debt. Doug was married to Margot and his family, Hubert, Larry, was a country party minister in the Fadden and Menzies governments. And his son, Larry, continued the tradition of public service as an elected National Party member for Richmond, New South Wales from 1996 to 2004. And his contribution to the party continues right to this day in his role as president of the party. Doug was a formidable ally for people outside the capital cities, and there's no doubt regional Australia would be worse off without his fierce advocacy on their behalf. He was instrumental in securing closer trade ties with New Zealand, the Middle East, Japan and China. But what I want to touch on is the extraordinary impact that he had through just one decision for my home state of Queensland. Tourism guru Sir Frank Moore was spearheading a charge to have Queensland bid to host the 1988 World Expo. Now, World Expos had to date been financially very onerous on the host countries. They had not always been financially successful. Sometimes the land around them was left uh, in very poor condition and undeveloped. But Queensland, riding on the back of 30 years of successful uh, management and, in, and administration by the National Party government, was confident. They had turned the state from an agrarian economy into a powerhouse in mining, in industrial development, cheap electricity, cheap land, cheap water. Uh, it had developed extraordinary tourism assets. And in, early, in the early 1980s, we knew that we were ready to host a world-leading exposition. However, regional is in the eye of the beholder, and the Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser, believed that it was Sydney or Melbourne that should host such an event. But both Sydney and Melbourne didn't believe that they would be able to successfully hold such an event, that they didn't want the financial and other burdens. And so the Prime Minister had refused Queensland's request to go to Paris to uh, lodge a request for us to bid to hold this event. Now, unfortunately for the Prime Minister, he had had an accident on his farm and it hurt his back. And Doug Anthony, sworn in as the acting Prime Minister, uh, was in the top job. Now, Sir Frank Moore, ever the opportunist, quickly, uh, having heard the news on the radio that morning, quickly rang the Premier of Queensland and said to him that he must immediately ring the acting Prime Minister and put to him the idea that Brisbane should be the host of this uh, exposition. Now, Joe did exactly that, and Doug Anthony, acting with the decisive and future-looking vision that we'd heard of so much this afternoon, uh, immediately granted the request and Brisbane won the bid to host the Expo, which went down to be one of the most successful Expos ever held and was one of the very few to turn a profit. Now, I worked at that Expo, and I'm proud to see that it was a turning point for Queensland. We went to, having, uh, to being a very sleepy country town that closed at lunchtime on Saturday. Uh, there was no outdoor eating. Um, we didn't have the international quality hotels and events that we now have so many of. Uh, we had international acts that hosted the river that uh, were hosted by the river stage, um, and there are many extraordinary stories of good times at, uh, at the expo. <laughs> but it did. It changed the future of Brisbane and Queensland. It turned us into a confident city capable of hosting international events and capable of developing um, further uh, along the lines that we already had. Um, the, the bustling dining, entertainment and recreation precinct of South Brisbane is a jewel in Brisbane's crown and will forever be a legacy of Doug Anthony's brave and timely decision to back Queensland and back regional Australia. Thank you.
There being no further speakers, I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I thank the senators. Senators, it is also with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 17th of January 2021 of John Harold Sullivan, a former member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Longman, Queensland, from 2007 to 2010.